Well, complete sample model. This is the last talk of our series, Museums Talk from the United Kingdom. And Tessa Jackson, OBA, Chief Executive at INIVA, is our last guest. First of all, I would like to thank her for joining us. Welcome to Istanbul, Tessa. Institute of International Visual Arts was established in 1994 with government funding to address the imbalance in the representation of culturally diverse artists, creators and writers within cultural discourse in the United Kingdom at the time. INIVA now operates in a more globalized world where the meaning of diversity itself is endlessly shifting and changing. INIVA continues to encourage new and unheard voices, creating space where the politics of race and representation can be explored. Tessa Jackson will discuss the challenges and importance of museums and galleries, exploring internationalism and alternative perspectives through exhibitions and collections. Now, finally, I would like to thank the British Council Turkey Director Margaret Jack and her team members, the Head of Arts Turkey, Esra Aysun, and the Arts Manager, Cansu Ataman, for this wonderful collaboration. And I also would like to thank Istanbul Modern Creator, Çelik Bafra, and the Assistant Creator and Artistic Program Coordinator, Mirnur Temel, all of their efforts to make this project and the talks possible. Okay, now it's my pleasure to invite Margaret, please. Well, thank you very much, Levin Bey. Çok teşekkürler. İyi akşamlar. Tekrar hoş geldiniz. And welcome, as we say, to the eighth and the final talk in the series, Museums Talk from the UK. And can I say what it's been an absolute pleasure to collaborate with Istanbul Modern and the team here through the Museums Talk program. So a huge thank you to Levent Bey, Celek Hanım and the team. Since its opening in 2004, Istanbul Modern has absolutely plugged Istanbul directly into the interconnected global art scene and it's powering the imagination of everyone who visits this, this superb museum and its collections its exhibitions. And it's really been Istanbul Modern who has been one of the main drivers in Istanbul's rapid rise to become a truly international creative hub. And so initiatives such as this program are providing an excellent opportunity for collaboration beyond Turkey. So in this example, we're bringing together prominent UK museum professionals with peers from Turkey to share ideas, to develop skills, and foster links, and these lead to successful partnerships for cultural and commercial benefit. We at the British Council are committed to extending opportunities for international connection through the arts well beyond Istanbul, which is why we've also taken five of our UK guest speakers to Bursa to deliver talks to new audiences in collaboration with Bursa Metropolitan Municipality. The UK Museums Talk program has been attended by 1,500 people and many more across Turkey have the opportunity to watch it online anytime, both in Turkish and in English, through our Vimeo account. So just click on the link from our website, www.britishcouncil.org.tr. And we've worked to ensure that our speakers from the UK have reflected the diversity and the cultural roots of the four nations which make up the United Kingdom. And I hope we've inspired our audiences, both in the room and through our uh, digital connections. We hope we've inspired you to venture beyond London to enjoy the vibrancy of contemporary arts throughout the UK. So today, we complete the series by celebrating diversity in visual arts. And it's particularly meaningful for us at the British Council as we're getting ready this year to celebrate our 75th year in Turkey. Our work is centered on building meaningful, enduring and respectful relationships across different cultures. 
And as we've been refreshing our memory through our archives about Turkey, we're taking great pride in having touched the lives of millions for the better. However, we could not have done this if we didn't have a commitment to equality and to inclusion and to valuing the richness that diversity brings. And really, it's how all of us as individuals and as institutions think, how we talk, how we practice the arts. It reveals very much about the kind of society we are. And it makes the case that diversity is not only essential to a proper understanding of culture, but also of a country, and of a country understanding itself. Museums, of course, play a critical role helping us to learn and grow. And they offer people from all walks of life the chance for self-reflection, to think about the world, to think about their place in it, and the opportunity to develop the creative skills to flourish in our constantly shifting, globalized world. So with these thoughts in our mind, and before handing over to Tessa Jackson, I would just like to thank you, our audience, and our audience for every talk over the last three months, to thank our speakers, and of course to thank Istanbul Modern for making the UK Museum's talk series for us a very special and a very notable program. So thank you. Please enjoy your evening. Çok sağlım. I think I'm fine. Good evening. Ooh. <laughs> um, firstly, can I thank Levent and Margaret very much indeed, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm interested in the discussion we might have afterwards and what you make of uh, some of the points I might make. But now I know I'm being recorded and that people can watch me online, I may decide to amend one or two things. <laughs> um, however, let me just... Just to say, I've put the word reflections in the title very much to... I think they are reflections, having worked in the visual arts over the last 30 years or so, have worked both locally, internationally. Locally, of course, can mean many different things, having worked in Wales, Scotland, England, but also uh, in other countries outside of the UK. And I think I give some perspectives, probably from the UK, but I was interested in my email exchanges before coming tonight as to how we all interpret the words cultural diversity. Um, I'm speaking, I think, this evening as a curator, a director of not-for-profit arts organizations, um, where one's trying to enable artists to discuss key issues that we contend with in everyday lives. Um, for me, it's always been about bringing the local uh, and the global together. And I think the politics of race are a given. It doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter uh, what kind of world you live in. And in order to live with the politics of race, I think you have to be very aware of them. But I'm speaking to an audience who I know live in the cradle of civilization. So I'm interested to know what you think and perhaps the discussion we have afterwards. This is a fantastic work by Fernando Bryce, who's a Peruvian artist who lives in Germany, and it's a, um, a redrawing of something in the newspapers in 1912. And I'll just leave you to read it, because I think some of it's still quite relevant, and uh, where there might be labor troubles and this kind of thing, it crops up again. <laughs> But I'd like to start off, what do we mean by cultural diversity? UNESCO, and you'll forgive me just starting with the word culture, describes culture as a set of distinctive spiritual, material, intellectual, and emotional features of society or a social group. In addition to the arts, culture describes, of course, lifestyles, ways of living together, value systems, traditions, and beliefs. Respecting and safeguarding culture is a matter of human rights. Let's say that culture, in its broadest sense, 
means to express shared experience. I think here in Istanbul, you probably use the phrase cultural diversity pretty much as I do in London. In fact, museums, libraries, and archives London, uh, a sort of overarching body, uh, has said, in the context of our work today, we use the term cultural diversity to mean the complex composition of society made up of individuals and groups who may have multiple identities. These may relate to ethnicity, faith, gender, sexual orientation, and intellectual and physical ability, but might equally include health status and educational and social background. So I think cultural diversity is clearly very, is all-encompassing. For the British Film Institute, they say, for them it also embodies a recognition of differing cultural heritages and perspectives. The phrase cultural diversity also acknowledges respect of fundamental freedoms, namely freedom of thought, conscience, religion, of opinion and expression, and freedom to participate in the cultural life of one's choice. It assumes that culture takes diverse forms, and this very diversity is embodied in the uniqueness and plurality of the identities of the groups and societies that make up humankind. So cultural diversity has become a, a term used within public policy, certainly in the UK, by governments, international cultural bodies, as well as by arts funding bodies and funding agencies. And it's, it's also a term used by our national galleries and museums. All these bodies use it to indicate diversity across ethnicity, disability, as well as sexual orientation. But this evening, I'm going to particularly look at the politics of race. Why is cultural diversity of interest? Why is it important? When the phrase is used positively, cultural diversity is seen as a source of exchange, innovation, and creativity. It's as necessary for humankind, I would argue, as biodiversity is for the natural world. Understanding and valuing cultural diversity are the keys to countering racism and intolerance. And in fact, in the 1980s, it was the European Union even came together under the motto, United in Diversity. The newly formed European Union encouraged the free flow of people, trade, services, and goods across countries. As a result of migratory demographics, things began to change. However, often cultural diversity is used to describe a portion of society rather than the whole society. There is an implication that somehow diversity is only applicable to a certain group of people. It's a kind of, it's not us, but it's them. I think this, uh, this slide of a group of people in the National Museum in Wales, Cardiff, coming to see the work of the Finnish artist Ayalisa Attila. And is that a culturally diverse audience? And culturally diverse in the UK, some people use very much to refer to the ladies sitting down. But in fact, are they any more culturally diverse than my family with connections to Switzerland and my mother being born in India? So I think it's interesting how we use these words, which are very open words, but we become, they start to describe the particularities. What's interesting, I think, too, about this slide is the effect globalization, and I think it was Margaret who mentioned it, effect of globalization on our societies. And in a way, this uh, sums it up to a degree if you think about where the artwork came from, the nature of the audiences, where, where they're sitting. Um, but we recognize globalization as the process by by which regional economies, societies, and cultures become more connected, even integrated, through technology, transportation, and trade. This process is perhaps one of the most defining characteristics of our times, and hence there are many debates about whether globalization increases or reduces cultural diversity or homogenization. For merit, many, the influences of Western culture through the media are substituting for and competing with local and minority cultures. Globalization as a process is often blamed for increasing loss of identity and dislocation. 
Others argue that greater cultural exchange is likely to increase tolerance and understanding, and more access to information can create beneficial lifestyle and social changes. So globalization has contributed to our collective need to understand cultural diversity, I would argue. And I'm now going to go on to the UK context. Our understanding of diversity in Britain has changed significantly over the, last, over the past 20 to 30 years. During this time, government policies, societal changes, and public perception have been shaped by an increasing knowledge and understanding of immigration and its effect. By 2011, the UK's population with an ethnic background other than white doubled in size from 1991, from 3 million to 7 million. And that means, it's, in terms of the total population, that's 14% of the population. This means that one in five people identified with an ethnic group other than white British, compared to some 13% 10 years earlier. Over the time, the UK's immigration po immigrant population has tended to be described by the larger African Caribbean and South Asian communities, all those who have settled in Britain originally from Commonwealth countries or former colonial territories. And this, to those of us who are linked to Britain, is a very familiar image of the boat called the Windrush, which was the first boat to come to Britain from the Caribbean in 1948. And following this, a whole series of boats. And if you talk to anybody of this generation, they remember vividly exactly which boat they were on at what time they came over. More recent emerging demographic, demographic and social patterns are now being referred to as super diversity, emphasizing the complexities which the UK is now experiencing with additional communities of people with connections to Somalia, Vietnam, Poland, and there are many others. Super diversity has been referred to as, and this is the academic description, dynamic interplay of variables among an increased number of new, small, and scattered, multiple origin, transnationally connected, socioeconomically differentiated, and legally stratified immigrants who have arrived over the last decade. I think that simply means that where they're coming from, has, they're coming from uh, different parts of the world for perhaps quite different reasons. These changes over the same period led to an ongoing discussion as to how, in our cultural activity, we recognize these changes in our society. And it was in 1989, obviously a long time ago now, a report called Towards Cultural Diversity was published. At the time, the political environment was one that aimed to celebrate the opportunities that multicultural Britain had to offer, although this was not necessarily achieved. This is an interesting image by the black artist Eddie Chambers, uh, and I'll come on to talk about him and a number of other artists in a minute. But towards cultural diversity was a marker for the change in public policy, that the Arts Council, the main funding body of the UK's contemporary arts, was changing its approach. It identified the obstacles that existed to the development and positioning of the so-called ethnic arts, the greatest of these was identified as, as the degree to which the national consciousness had insulated itself against foreign intrusion. The national cultural consciousness was Western, Eurocentric, even insular. Its interaction with the culturally other was simply to relegate it to the margins and contain it at the periphery. This report recommended that the arts needed to change and engage with the culturally other at every opportunity. So this was in 1989. The paper signified a move away from a debatably separatist position that meant ethnic minority arts, as they were then referred to, as almost a separate cultural scene, being funded by a separate provision with specific black cultural centers being established for ethnic minority artists and practitioners. The recommendation, of course, in this report was to move to a more inclusive aim towards cultural diversity. In fact, the paper at the end asked the reader to imagine what the British national culture would look like in the year 2000, so 11 years after it was published. 
It was through this imagining that the concept of cultural diversity was expressed. It saw a broad, heterogeneous national culture, reflecting the diversity of cultural achievement issuing from all parts of contemporary society. So at one point it was very much separate, and this was recommended that it should be integrated in the arts as a whole. This work is by uh, a colleague of Eddie Chambers, the previous artist, Donald Rodney, and it's called In the House of My Father. And this work was made in 1997. And what's interesting about these two artists, the works I've just shown you, and several other artists, including Marlene Smith, Claudette Johnson, and Keith Piper, they were a, a group that called themselves the Pan-African Connection. They, they were all young, they were all recently left college, and as a group, they began to organize exhibitions and events which drew attention to the issues of blackness, stereotyping, and the social and political context which had to be negotiated by the black community in Britain. I remember going to a talk by Eddie Char Chambers, the previous artist, of how many times he'd been st stopped by the police simply going about his business. It was a very tricky time for young black people in Britain. Immigration from the Caribbean during the post-war years meant a number of cities across the country now had very visible young black communities, second-generation children who wanted to question and change their social and economic status, which obviously, social and economically, they were not always in a strong, they were very rarely in a strong position. The 1980s became a period of dynamic cultural activity with racially charged images, stories, and experiences being expressed right across the arts. The Pan-African Connection was la later renamed the Black, and the A and the C are missing, the Black Art Group, and through the 80s and 90s, its members made work, many centering on issues of racial difference, the meaning of Britishness, and key post-colonial and politi politicized debates. This period, in fact, is now referred to as the critical decade in the visual arts, and the group is now known as the Black Art Movement. And I think it's interesting, these two works, this is Donald Rodney, he's no longer with us, um, but it's a small house, you can see the size of it, made from his own skin. It was very much questioning, uh, it's in the house of my father. There are re religious connections, possibly, but it's also where was he living? Was, it the, was, it, was he living in a place of his own culture? Was he living in something that was very fragile? As you can see, it's held together with pins. It's an extraordinary little work, and many people do not realize it's actually made out of human skin. Towards cultural diversity argued for change to be made in the cultural sector, not only in supporting artists and the associated cultural fields, such as curators, programming, and general employment, but in the terminology and conditions. In some ways, the report acted as a call for an understanding of the right for an artist to self-identify, an understanding that to expect an artist to represent or discuss specific issues because of their cultural background or ethnicity was limiting to artistic freedom and not expected of other artists. This is the Chinese Art Center in Manchester, which still ex exists today. It's called the Center for Chinese Art. And all over um, the UK, there tended to be formations of artists. Sometimes they managed to get a building in order to discuss and represent their work. They had a very different time from kind of Damien Hirst getting a, um, a warehouse in London and getting the media attention. This was quite a different kind of trajectory the, these artists had. The Arts Council was an arm's length institution from government which funded artistic activity, and it had commissioned this report. Yet it recognized that it had a responsibility to cultural diversity through advocacy, marketing, and research, and most importantly, through its funding of culturally diverse artistic practice. By making a far stronger commitment to focus the national consciousness on cultural diversity, and by facilitating the emergence of culturally diverse art into the mainstream, it felt that it would increase accessibility of the arts with the public. Because actually you had cities with major communities uh, where the, the feeling was the art on display in their local museum or gallery had no connection to their own cultural background. 
For the first time, the Arts Council acknowledged that the new inner city development plans must take account and support the cultural needs of communities who form part of the heterogeneous national culture. This was an extraordinary show in 1998 at the Whitechapel Art Gallery of the Caribbean artists who came to live and work in Britain called Aubrey Williams. While these policy changes were occurring, questions about the parameters of the British National Collection were also being voiced with increasing regularity, questions that had been gaining urgency since the 70s. Who did the National Collection include and who should it represent? Who formed its audiences? While these questions might at one point have represented a fear or mourning of the loss of a national identity, the 90s seemed to embrace the shift towards cultural diversity, with multicultural Britain being high on the po political agenda. In turn, the questions posed of the national opened up inquiries into the dynamic between the national and the international, about the changes in geopolitical context, and since the Second World War, the decolonization colonization and drive for nation building. And remember, this is Britain, where during the 60s, many areas of the world that were colored in pink, which meant they were part of the British Empire, had worked towards independence. Well, if you imagine in the 80s, where those countries were at, defining their own uh, identity, but also finding they were not necessarily part of the international cultural map. And many of their relatives might be based in Britain. So the discussion between the national and the international was very real for many people. And it was before sort of mass cheap travel, but it was already starting. The rising frequency of the term global as a description of the operating environment and its cons consequent effects on the understanding of the international gradually shifted the territory inhabited by the arts. While the international had previously been a term to describe the European and North American art scene, the increase in post-colonial nations led to a necessary widening of understanding of the international. And this is a work by Mona Hatoum, who is Palestinian, but family lived in Lebanon, and came to study in Britain, but then uh, because of the Lebanese war, was not able to go home, so has been based in Britain and is now based in Britain and uh, Berlin. But her work is called Continental Drift, and it's quite interesting. And we've all done that with different atlases. How big are different countries, and, and which countries do you see first? Ironically, the presence in British museums of objects like the Elgin marbles, Benin bronzes, and many thousands of less known objects from the empire raised immediate questions of legitimacy. It could be argued that the presence of minority communities in the UK helped legitimize museums collecting and stewardship. This kind of presence demanded a radical rethink of the ways in which those objects were shown, contextualized, and interpreted. By the mid-90s, the idea, nature, and product of the British art institution was also moving through a number of significant changes. Departing from the perception of museums as repositories of national collections and elitist spaces reserved for those initiated in the disciplines of culture, the museum and the gallery space was increasingly emerging as a space of social engagement. With the arts overall, participatory practice was becoming more commonplace, and the idea of inclusion was important to government. The role of the cultural institution was being critiqued, and the wider perception of the value of the arts and culture was changing. It set off a concern for who was represented in the major national collections, who was being employed in the arts, the diversity of practitioners, and the need to provide interpretation and education that encouraged better understanding of the art itself, and by that, better understanding by a much wider range of audiences. This is a fantastic uh, work, which is one of a series um, called The Diary of a Victorian Dandy, and was commissioned by Innova, my organization, before I got there. Um, he's a British Nigerian artist, and he did a series, he set up a series of images through the day. This one is at 1400 hours, and he's, I think you can tell which he is, 
and he did a whole series and placed himself as the sort of lord of the manor, uh, the earl of the country house. And th these were printed very large and ran across the London underground for a number of months. And of course, it generated extraordinary discussion. Um, Yinka Shonibare is now MBE, and he always, you cannot write his name without putting the MBE, um, given by the Queen. Um, but for him, it's now part of his identity. And for him, it's a kind of play, whether you're kind of, you're in or out of society. Um, but he continues and you, uh, to do extraordinary sort of questioning works. By 1999, a group of cultural bodies came together to discuss whose heritage, question mark, the impact of cultural diversity on Britain's living heritage. It's interesting, the conference was based upon the unsatisfactory track record of institutions as a whole in reflecting the diverse nature of society, the need for arts, heritage, and leisure sectors to consider the questions that this lack raised, the increasingly shifting nature of concepts such as identity and national heritage, and a need to revisit them in the light of shifts in society, and the growing strength of the movement within the African, Caribbean, Chinese, and Asian communities to document and see documentation of their presence and their contribution in galleries, museums, archives, archives and to recover hidden histories. It was also at this time we had um, a terrible murder of a young man aged 16 called Stephen Lawrence, and he was attacked by, they've never ever um, been uh, reprimanded fully, um, but it was by young white youths, and there was then a report called the McPherson Report, and it was a report into how was the court case and what happened to uh, Stephen Lawrence's death and his family thereafter, how, how was that dealt with? And the McPherson report came back with a very strong statement to British society saying the London, London police force was institutionally racist. So you can imagine the effect that had on society as a whole, where, you know, one of the, I think McPherson's a top judge, one of somebody then making that comment about one of the pillars of, of society. Back to this Who's, Who's Heritage conference. But the, its broad and, and fundamental aim was to debate the nature of British cultural heritage and its selectivity and the need to re redefine both. In the opening of the conference, the government's culture secretary, Chris Smith, admitted to the selective nature of history and then called for a more, and I quote, a more complete version of the truth. He outlined how whole sections of the community were forced to look elsewhere for f reflections of their existence and contribution, and this was not acceptable in an inclusive society. He exhorted cultural institutions and funding bodies to put in place strategies, and I quote again, to enable everyone to understand and appreciate their own cultural heritage and to experience those of other people. Professor Stuart Hall, who was the founding chair of Innova, and we'll come on to Innova in a minute, was a sociologist and cultural theory, and he also made a speech at this conference. And he said the debate had moved on from notions of included and excluded. He argue, argued that we should now be viewing history in rather different terms. Borders, he said, had effect, effectively dissolved. Globalization and the recognition of many authentic voices had overturned single hierarchical authority. This new environment allowed space for a variety of visions communicating on the basis of greater equality. He argued that the concept of heritage must include the active production of culture and the arts as a living activity alongside the conservation of the past. And it's interesting, the journalist who was chairing part of the conference and made the final speech, and as her name, Maya Jagji, might suggest that she comes uh, and she's written many times from an immigrant family. She felt that this new environment um, provided many challenges, and one of them was the determinedly Eurocentric view of society's gatekeepers, i.e. many of the museums and galleries attending the conference. 
but she urged that, the, urged that the heritage we construct should not simply be a question of inclusion, but of perspective and participation. And it's interesting, um, all these discussions were taking place, but, and my organization, Innova, came out of a decision of public policy. It was first proposed by an Arts Council in 1991. Anybody watching this talk online who knows anything about the British Arts will immediately be thumping the table. It came from the Arts Council, but after campaigns by artists, curators, uh, cultural critics, writers, who had campaigned for some substantial time, and it's thanks to them that public policy then funded an organization like Innova. Um, and it's, uh, and Innova uh, was going to be an institution that could develop critical debate about the nature of modern art and actively support a new international dialogue. This institution would aim to show a broader spectrum of contemporary visual arts practice than currently available in Britain at that time. And uh, in our library, we have a fantastic library, but it, some of the papers of the forming of the organization are obviously there for people to see. But I quote, at the time there was a statement, there is a greater demand for a space which recognizes a new reality based on multiplicities of cultures and an interaction between these which create a dynamic, pluralistic, cultural aesthetic. It is the new internationalist, new internationalist aesthetic which, that will be promoted by Innova, drawing upon contemporary artistic practice internationally and giving e exhibition space to British-based artists. So, in fact, the organization was finally set up in 94. There was a conference um, from which it came out of, and that conference um, debated what new internationalism could be. Therefore, new internationalism would address this discrepancy, the fact that many cultures, minority cultures within Western states, as, whether, as well as other world cultures, were not being discussed as part of world art history. Um, would address this discrepancy by placing the achievements of the majority of cultures of the world into the discourses, the exhibitions, and the history of the contemporary visual arts. More importantly, it would offer the visual perceptions, philosophies, and histories of non-European and minority culture as new and challenging, challenging contributions to the mainstream. And essentially, it reflected a changing moment, I think, in art history, resulting from post-war migration, certainly, but from the pressure of the voices that existed within the arts in Britain at that time. What was interesting about new internationalism, uh, it was not exclusive. The proposed institution, i.e. Innova, would not disregard the achievements of Western Europe and the USA, a, nor seek a negative confrontation with Western Eurocentric art history. There was a desire instead to broaden understanding of the history of art beyond the narrow confines of the past. New internationalism would embrace the concept of black art and facilitate cross-fertilization, which would go beyond the definitions of black art. Furthermore, new internationalism would introduce new ways of addressing production, exhibition, presentation and interpretation to generate critical debate within mainstream institutions with whom a healthy dialogue was envisaged. And it's interesting, I think you heard, or well, some of you will have heard Chris Durkin, who's the director of Tate Modern uh, earlier on in this series. Um, Chris Durkin used to be on the board of Innova until he got that job and then uh, he decided to retire. But he... Uh, he, I've been to various public presentations where he says that he would not have got the job at, at Tate Modern with its incredible international program if he had not been part of Innova. And it was that feeling that as a small organization, but with all sorts of active people, it pushed the boundaries of what people were looking at, who they were speaking to, even now, I sit in my office and the phone often goes and somebody's just down in reception from wherever. 
Uh, could they have a chat? Could they, they want to make some personal connection with an organization which they feel has generated a discussion which their culture might have been part of or they feel is going to put them in touch with other international networks? Um, what was interesting about Innova, it worked in different ways. It worked with education, training, so bringing more black and ethnic minorities into the arts. It made exhibitions. Uh, it also undertook research and published. And these books, published now, I think this is 2005, um, published some while ago, but still selling um, because they touch on material, on comment, uh, that is not necessarily found elsewhere. And it was a very important part of Innova was to provide the critical context for the artist, to provide comment, discussion. The first symposium that it came out of was called Global Visions, and it involved arts practitioners from all over the world. Um, and they spoke about new internationalism, um, mapping out terrain of its inquiries and raising questions as the context of its investigations through papers such as The Non-Sovereign -so Self by the Australian Aboriginal artist Gordon Bennett, The Silent Message of the Museum by African-American artist Fred Wilson, and I think any of you who know his work, he totally critiques what a museum decides to present and put on show, and that can, how that can completely change your reading of history. And he's gone into a number of museums in the States and represented because his, his history as a black man will be completely different from perhaps one that the museum has presented so far. Um, so this is the kind of institute of uh, Innova's work. This project also started as a symposium, a collaborative project to create a live body of work that aimed to change the parameters and understanding of art history and its thinking. And in fact, what it does is, um, it literally, as the title says, annotating arts histories. It literally comments on art histories to date. It's a, a very interesting read, uh, showing quite, quite different readings of paintings and artists and thinking. So Innova started in 1994, uh, didn't have a building, was working all over the place on the London Underground, on billboards, in shops, all of that kind of activity. But it's interesting, I found a quote from the artist, the American artist, Glenn Ligon, and he said, whenever I came to London from New York, I would meet artists who were working on really interesting and innovative projects. The name Innova kept coming up, and I was curious to find out more about this mysterious organization that was doing terrific work. I have to say, I can say all of this. I wasn't involved at that time. In the United States, it's rare to find an arts organization that is committed to being a bridge between different constituencies and institutions that allows artists to realize projects that they would not have had the technical and financial support to do on their own, and is involved in public debates on the role art plays in contemporary society. Um, he felt that Innova was a, a model of an arts organization. And it's interesting, um, we now look back over our own history to see who we've worked with. And at the end of the 1990s, Chris Afili gained the Turner Prize and Steve McQueen, there was an earlier image of his work, also gained the Turner Prize. So it is about visibility, it is about a wider understanding of their work. But of course, um, this is Chris Afili. Um, the media, of course, alighted on the fact that he used elephant dung in his work uh, on the left. But I think it's interesting that this, I'll allow you to read it, um, still goes on, and this was in 2005. It was at the Venice Biennale, where the Gorilla Girls um, made a work which was basically this, a huge sign. Um, well, it was a sign, and beside it was 
if you know the work of the guerrilla girls, go around in guerrilla suits. So beside the sign was, was a guerrilla suited person. It was a powerful statement that kind of only hinted at the complexity of a pr problem that I think even persists now, where there are countries that are considered to be at the center of things, and then, there, of course, there are other countries that are not. This uh, is Rivington Place, where Innova resides. Uh, we decided to club together with Autograph, the Association of Black Photographers, and found lottery funding, as you could then, in the UK, and had the building designed by David Ajay, who's a British Ghanaian architect. Uh, and it houses two organizations, a number of other uh, SMEs, creative companies who pay rent and help run the building, plus exhibition space and the Stuart Hall Library. And we also have an education facility there. I think what's interesting is the world now is so international in some ways. So how does an organization like Innova continue to do work that generates questions that people take note of? And when I first got involved with Innova, um, I worked with an Indian artist called N.S. Harsha. And it was a work I had seen in Sharjah, at the Sharjah Biennial. But I particularly selected it for Innova at Rivington Place. Rivington Place is not far from Brick Lane and uh, the, the sort of textile industry uh, of East London. So this work, if you can see it, let me just, is, is comprises 192 uh, hand sewing machines. And but on each of the sewing machines is a piece of calico painted uh, in the colors of a frag. The 192 uh, signifies the number of countries at that time um, in the UN. And it means that some places are not there because they're not part of the UN, such as Taiwan, who got kind of chucked out because China wanted to join the UN. So he made this piece, and between the sewing machines, he pushed, pulled colored thread. So you could see it from the window outside, and you could see it inside. I can't tell you the public response. Women who would probably never have come into the building, who said, I spent all my life beside one of these pieces of machinery, and was very interested in what, how the project came about. But it also threw up all sorts of other things. Um, the work was made in Sharjah, but they did not want the Israeli flag to be represented. So there was a long discussion, and the artist said, Either you have the work and it has 192 flags, or you don't have the work. And then they come to a compromise that there's a piece of calico with some light blue painting started. The flag is started, but not completed. So that was fine. But here in London, they laid out the flags, and guess what the Israeli flag was next to? It was the Syrian flag. And the artist said, no, no, just leave it. It was random. That's how we're going to leave it. And I think what's interesting is how artists pick up on very serious issues, but allow you to debate those issues in a way that includes women who wouldn't perhaps normally come to an art gallery. Um, kids, of course, ran around. Um, East End of London is full of so many nationalities that uh, they were all spotting the different flags. So it was a piece that had extraordinary kind of resonance on so many levels. It was all in the building. Can you see it's yeah, in, inside? And we just built it on scaffolding. Uh, you couldn't, un I really wanted us to be able to walk around the different levels, but we, health and safety came in, so we couldn't quite do that. But uh, I think it's interesting, new international and where we've got to and the sort of global art world that we now have. And it's interesting that, uh, in a way, the international success of artists like Mona Hatoum and Steve McQueen um, 
implied for some that British art was beyond identity and attention moved from the experiences of those with hyphenated identities to the politics of globalization. And I mentioned earlier the fear of what globalization might do for some communities. And it's interesting um, here, this was drawn up by an art historian and signifies that there's more than 200 biennials now in different parts of the world. Those are just some of them. And I believe you have quite a number here in Turkey. I've been learning about them today. Um, and it, this sort of using the, the fact that there are now so many different uh, focuses for art, does that mean that we, uh, that there's a kind of globalized uh, aesthetic, a globalized, um, uh, uh, that you have to make work that suits this sort of globalized image of art. And I just wanted to show you, this is an extraordinary project that I made in a job before Innova down in Cardiff called Artist Mundi, Arts of the World. And it's a prize, an exhibition, publication conference, lots of other things. But invited in 2004 the Chinese artist Xu Bing to be part of the project. And uh, he let me know by email that he wanted to use dust from 9-11. He, uh, he has a studio in Chinatown in New York, and he had collected dust. We had to get it uh, tested. Uh, he in order to bring it into the country, he didn't want to bring it in in a bag of white powder, so he made it into a small doll in a mold of his daughter's, one of his daughter's toys. So we got it sent in in a shoebox, and then he made this extraordinary work. Uh, where does the dust itself collect? Um, and I think what was extraordinary was uh, a Chinese artist who had left China because of the difficulties of practicing in China in 89, went to the States on a MacArthur scholarship, had a studio there, made this work, with the, which then uh, appeared in Wales, in Cardiff. And it was one of the few works that actually responded to 9-11. I think many artists uh, were concerned what they could do with it. Um, Xu Bing did actually tell me he tried several museums, but nobody would, would show it. They felt that it might be too sensitive. So it's interesting in terms of the diversity of the conversation that we're trying to generate. In fact, in Cardiff, it was, it was thought to be a hugely thoughtful, important piece. Uh, and there was a great deal of comment. People were very quiet when they went into the space. Um, and so I think it's interesting what, what work is presented where. Uh, he has now presented it in New York, but he presented it um, some years later in, in fact, uh, 2011. Um, so my question, uh, does it mean with all this kind of globalization that we end up with work that could be made anywhere. And it's interesting, here you have Levant with a, a Russian uh, curator, Victor Missiano, who came to work on, on the Welsh project, Artis Mundi. Does it mean a homogenization of aesthetics? Artists are looking for international visibility. Does this mean they move away from traditional forms? Um, in fact, I think most art responds to a local context, not defined by national sensibilities. But it is interesting that uh, this is an artist from Mali, Abdullah Kanate, uh, who you could say uses a traditional aesthetic, but um, if you move towards his other work, it is using exactly the same uh, Motifs, these kind of, I'm not going to use the problem, but these small, they're, they're made out of the textile and they're gris gris and they come from a traditional uh, way that hunters decorate their tunics in order to bring themselves luck out hunting. And so he places them onto quite a political piece, but what he is wanting to bring luck 
uh, at this particular time to a, uh, a, peace, a series of peace discussions. This is an interesting artist who, um, Anthony Key, born in South Africa, of Chinese parents, then moved to Britain, and this work, he calls it his self-portrait. It's a tomato ketchup bottle filled with soy sauce. He does a lot of work through food and cooking. And um, I did a show called uh, Entanglement about artists who feel that their own identity, their kind of portrait of themselves is quite complicated. I mean, he's Chinese, moved to Britain. He went uh, to China and realized he was no longer anything to do with being Chinese. Uh, but he did this fabulous work across our window, which was over 5,000 chopsticks of all the Chinese takeaways um, in uh, it's the UK, and all the names, and which were the most popular names. And uh, that it's made in a beautiful way, almost like a, a Chinese menu with sewn together chopsticks. An artist like Bernie Searle from South Africa, this work's called Snow White. There's a type of flower in South Africa which is called Snow White. And she did this extraordinary piece with two screens of herself being covered. It's falling from the ceiling, flower, but all you see is her own body. Uh, and she was called Cape Coloured. And she begin, over time, she becomes completely white. It's a, a video work, and the, the kids that came in with school parties into the National Museum of Cardiff to this were completely transfixed by it. And the kind of discussion that it generated, Cardiff being a port, is actually uh, quite diverse in terms of its own communities. And this work had such an extraordinary effect on kids of five or six and the discussion they then had about who they were. I'm going to jump on a bit. I could talk, as you can see, about all sorts of artists. This is an extraordinary artist called Lida Abdul from Afghanistan. And I think it's interesting how we learn about cult cultures, learn about other people. So much it's from the media. But I think what's extraordinary is artists can provide very different images, very different kind of level of discussion. And somebody like Lida, uh, she, she no longer lives full time in Afghanistan, but has produced these extraordinary works. This, these called, this work's called The Brick Sellers, where she recreated something that actually happens, where the kids go and find bricks from damaged buildings, and then they sell them back to a merchant who gives them money. It's an extraordinary work by Adrian Patsy, who is Albanian, um, and uh, this work is, is a film where you focus, the, the camera focuses on the people excited, uh, not talking to each other, but sort of clearly in anticipation, and then the camera draws back, and you can see they are going nowhere. Uh, and it's sort of both, uh, both kind of humorous, but also poignant. Um, Adrian said of his own... Of his, of his work, Albanian and our emigration are the context of our works rather than their theme. Um, and this is another work of his that follows uh, migrant labors. They're all sitting on a place with their little generators generating their lights, uh, and they all go to uh, situate themselves on this building to get work. So, I'm going to jump ahead. Um, but Innova, what can it continue to do within this sort of globalized, cultural, diverse world? And what's interesting, we've gone through a period of sort of consultation and real exploring what are we going to be in the future. And the three things that have kind of come out of it is support for artists who have unusual voices emerging, may be overlooked, both in the UK and internationally. Innova has been for some time not just about the black voice, but the plurality of its voices, and we will continue to do that. Another area that is seen to be very important is the generation of the debate around the work 
actually having that with a wider public. So we're going to be working much more out of London, in other cities, in other places. We will work internationally, but we'll do much more of that at home to sort of generate the debate in Bradford, a city that's now majority Asian, which has got quite a lot of uh, issues, discussions to be had, and are interested in how artists are talking about uh, these questions. Bradford. Um, and the third area is we have this extraordinary, I'll just nip through, we have this extraordinary library called the Stuart Hall Library. Um, and th through it and through our work, what we want to do is encourage uh, a greater understanding and interest in a variety of art histories. This uh, it contains over 10,000 volumes, a lot of magazines that you won't necessarily get elsewhere, a lot of original papers by artists, some of the artists uh, who we worked with in the 90s. Um, and I think it's interesting to kind of make sure that the, the journey of diversity within the visual arts has at least one home in the kind of documents, the material, slides, DVDs, videos that can be seen by, by future uh, art historians and audiences. I suppose I wanted to really finish on this extraordinary image by an artist whose um, parents left India and went into Thailand. And he grew up in Thailand, but he's married a Japanese woman, and his daughter is now Japanese Thai Indian. And this is an extraordinary um, three, four, no, it's four meter long drawing of the community that he is part of. And if you lived in his community, you would recognize those per people. But it also shows, uh, this is up near Chiang Mai, uh, the diversity of that particular community. And he showed this work with very moving footage of people of his parents' generation talking about leaving India uh, during partition and moving to Thailand and how they've been received in Thailand. And so I think the sort of di diversities of our communities uh, have happened at so many different times and in so many different ways. But the kind of the extraordinary mes message of his film was uh, hospitality, reception, understanding, um, and an openness of one community to another community. This is a Japanese writer, but I think it, it kind of says that the diversity of our community is not always easy, but actually uh, it's kind of an important, I think it's an important motto and something I've tried to do in my, in my own way as a curator is presenting these very different voices, often talking about very universal ideas and themes, but talking both to communities who have a direct relationship to that artist, but sometimes no relationship at all. And Artist Mundi became the most successful uh, exhibition in the National Museum, beyond Dinosaurs, which is very popular in Britain, and beyond something called Doctor Who, which is a television program, which is... So contemporary art, making it above uh, sort of um, other forms of... Com contemporary culture, and why, when people were asked why was this an important project, an exhibition to come to, they said they knew none of the artists' names, they're not necessarily well known. It was because of the sort of discussion, the involvement, the visuality of the material, and how they could uh, respond to it. So, thank you. Time for a few questions, if there are any questions or comments, maybe. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, thank you, Tessa, very much. I, I enjoyed hearing about um, uh, Innova and, and your work. It's really just a, an observation uh, something that you maybe referred to, but I'd like to see if you, 
respond to it further. I, th I think that uh, over the maybe two decades that you were referring to um, in of um, uh, the agenda of diversity in the arts in the UK, um, there's been um, uh, a lot of work done in thinking about diversity in, in, in programs in arts institutions and some affirm affirmative action happening and some initiatives uh, supported by Arts Council England, for instance, um, uh, and also some work thinking about diversity of audiences, which some, sometimes is, is quite a tricky issue to... I, I, I mean, I, I don't think that work... I think that work has a long way to go still to think about the diversity of audiences. And then, of course, the other aspects of um, the institutions need to think about when they're thinking about equality and diversity in their work is their workforce, the, the people that are employed as staff within institutions. And very often, the di cultural diversity of large arts institutions is quite stratif uh, stratified um, between uh, those that are involved in the programming and those that are involved in other mm. areas of an organization's activity. And I just wanted to get a more specific kind of thought from you about um, how are we going to tackle that? You know, and, and this, is, this is an issue of really of the wider society, not only the arts, isn't it? Um, quite quite a series of questions, the, big so, ones too. So the arts, um, how can the arts take a lead on that? Well, I, th I think it is by initiating projects and working with artists that are kind of asking the questions. Um, and I have to say this talk was very much about the visual arts, but there's been a lot of important work in theatre, as you can imagine. Classical music uh, is also trying to challenge itself because otherwise its audiences tend to be a much older age group. What is interesting with the work at Innova, we have, we have the youngest audiences of any gallery in London. We, we do sort of common research across uh, quite a lot of different galleries. And I think it's, it, is, it is that who are you trying to reach and are you programming the kind of work that they're, they're going to be interested by and you have to sometimes t try that and test that out and the other thing is to, to talk to your audiences to know who they are and what they might be interested in that's not necessary to kind of completely pander to an interest in you know if you ask a lot of young people in Britain they'll be interested in celebrities I mean Innova doesn't do anything to do with celebrities but actually I can think of a number of artists who kind of critique the whole notion of being a celebrity and, and would play with that. So I think, it, I think it's, it's very much really understanding uh, the context and the questions and the, and the discussion that you want to have. And sometimes you get it wrong. And then to understand perhaps why you've got it wrong. In terms of staffing, it is very important. I mean, it's interesting, I'm standing in front of you and the first white director of Innova. And when we did our consultation as to where we were going, I did say, I said, do you have, do you have a problem, a white director being in charge of an organisation like this? And some people said, well, I think you need a bigger advisory board and, you know, I, they, I needed other voices uh, beyond me and my team. My team is quite very diverse. Um, and other people said, no, it should no longer be about that. So I think, but I, th I think it is... Um, it is making sure that your team has a lot of different voices because then the organisation will say different things. Uh, hi. Uh, is there any government funding involved? Maybe you already said that I might have missed it, but how do you fund yourself, yes. basically? Innova was set up by the Arts Council of Great Britain, as it was then, which is a government-funded uh, we call it Quango. It's supposed to be arm's length, independent. You could debate whether it continues to be or not. Um, so we do get government funding. When I arrived, we raised, um, I think it was 8 or 12% of our funding. We now raise over 40. And that's the way, I mean, I know here there is no government funding for the arts, or very, very little. So we're in a different position, um, but we've had to change the way we work to now generate more funding and that's a kind of demand by our funder. The government percent uh, um, up until 31st of March was 60% and now it's going to be less. It's going to be under 50. Uh, do they interfere with your affairs? 
because <laughs> they have the 60 percent. Um, <laughs> I w wouldn't say interfere, no. I would say it's much more subtle than that. <laughs> Maybe because I'm Turkish, I use the long terming, sorry. <laughs> I, think, I, I certainly think we're an organization that doesn't always feel uh, we're supported at particular times depending on the government, let me put it like that. Um, you know, we, we, we, and particularly going forward, we've said debate is going to be one of our key areas of activity. Now, that's not always comfortable, but we feel, I mean, because we're a not-for-profit organization, we're not political, but what we're trying to do is broaden the debate. So, interference, no. Comment, yes. Um, and if you get a reduction in funding, what does that mean? It can mean a whole host of things. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. <laughs>